Good morning, class 12. So we have started with the last unit, last chapter of your syllabus. I discussed the first case study that is there, that is uh, on Amazonian forest and why the Amazonian forest was getting degraded, destroyed. And we also discussed the mitigation measures. So today, on page number 144, we will be discussing the second case study. There are three case studies that you are supposed to do. So we will be discussing the second case study that is ivory trade in Africa. That is the case study on elephants. The tusk, the ivory was extracted, elephants were killed for this particular act and how elephants became one of the endangered animals and this is the reason why we are studying the case study what happened in Africa. Okay, so uh, when we understand the ivory trade in Africa, uh, in 1970s, there were almost 1.2 million elephants, right? Huge number of elephants, so nobody was concerned about the number. But gradually, when this ivory trade began, an elephant slaughter started, uh, alarming decrease in the number of elephants, it came down to almost 50,000 only from 1.2 million. This was the reason of alarm all over the world. Uh, in 2000s, it was only countable 50,000 elephants that were left, right? So this was the time that CITES, uh, CITES as you all know, uh, its Convention on International Trade in uh, Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. So this is an international agreement. What did CITES do? when the number of elephants started dwindling, uh, they put a ban on trade of ivory. That was in the year 1979, way back. Okay, So 1979, sites banned the trade in ivory. But still, what we have to understand is illegal trade of ivory was still flourishing. Uh, this was because <clears throat> there was huge demand for ivory in Asia. Particularly, the demand was from Japan and China. These two countries largely demanded ivory and because of that even if the sites had banned the trade of ivory and slaughtering of these animals yet illegally the trade flourished. Okay, And this was uh, because of two countries that is Japan and China. So uh, over the last 10 years the price of wholesale ivory has doubled the way countries are demanding ivory, the price has doubled. So when people get double price, more and more slaughtering of elephants began illegally. Illegally. So what happened is over the years, the size and the frequency of consignments, consignments, the demands from countries has increased. Even, uh, even with the ban that was done by the sites, large shipments were going undetected from one country to an, uh, another. And what uh, the countries were trying to do is, instead of directly trading, they were sending the ivory through such routes, through such circles, not direct contact with the country, not directly trading with the country, but they were sending it to, through such a route that they could not be detected. Right. So uh, this was about uh, the decrease in the number of elephants because of which there was alarming uh, number of elephants left on the planet and this was the reason it caught the attention of the environmentalist. Banning was there but that did not help. So uh, later, later when uh, the government took strict measures on a trade of ivory, what the government did was in 1989 the African elephants in Africa, they put the elephants under Appendix 1. Appendix 1, or, or sorry, Appendix 2 of the sites listing. So when, uh, when we study about sites, there is Appendix 1, there is Appendix 2, there is Appendix 3, right? So Appendix 2 is less stricter for your understanding. Appendix 2, when we put some animals or plants under Appendix 2, it is less strictly monitored. It is not monitored as it should be monitored, right? So under this commercial trade of ivory was allowed with certain restrictions because the population of elephants had become very, very high, right? So 
what happened was uh, ivory trade was allowed with some restriction and uh, only those traders who had the license who had registered license they were allowed to trade in ivory uh, however this was not very successful in conserving the elephants so later again the usa they took unilateral decision to ban trade again so registered and licensed people were to, uh, still trading in the ivory so later the usa took a uh, decision alone that you have to ban the trade on ivory so in 1990s the elephants in spite of opposition from various countries many many countries they opposed but uh, the elephants were shifted uh, from appendix 2 to appendix 1 this meant that there was virtual ban on trade of elephants as i told you appendix 2 was a little less stricter but uh, later because registered licensed traders were still trading the USA took a decision to put the elephants under Appendix 1. Appendix 1 means that this particular animal was very, very strictly monitored, right? Illegal trade and uh, trading in ivory was totally stopped. Now, what happened? What was the consequence of this uh, putting the animal in Appendix 1 and strictly being monitored by the governments of countries? What happened is, uh, so the number of elephants again dramatically increased. There was a huge explosion in the population of elephants. Now that was also very very dangerous. So we will try to understand the second part of your uh, topic is what was the effect of this ban on trade. When we put a ban on trading elephants and putting the elephants, classifying them in appendix 1, and because of which the population of elephants became very very high what was the effect number one it says that the population of elephants which was declining at an alarming rate it made a comeback that means the elephants uh, population started rising and uh, the killing of elephants the slaughtering of elephants came down by almost 50 percent and this increase in elephant population has led to dangerous interaction with human beings that you also must have seen and heard of when the elephant population increases and there is scarcity of food inside the forest they do come out of the forest and then there is man wildlife conflict you must have heard of dangerous interactions of humans with elephants this is what started happening because the elephant population had become very very high there was a lot of conflict between man and elephant and there was competition for food and shelter and that then there was undesirable fallout then uh, the elephants started coming to the uh, rural areas where crops were destroyed houses were destroyed and there was a lot of destruction and then the government realized that the cost of preserving an elephant is very very high the huge animal requires a lot of money to conserve, right? So these were the problems that the government started facing. And with the ban, ivory could not be traded. The stock of legally acquired ivory that was there, with the government that was lying, that also became a problem for the government because the cost of storage of ivory is again very, very high. Whatever legal ivory the government had, with themselves they needed to store it properly because ivory gets dehydrated and decayed very very fast so the storage rooms have to be maintained again there was expenditure involved in maintaining the storage of ivory on the part of the government right so these were the problems of putting the animal from appendix 2 to appendix 1 the population increased and then there were dangerous interactions with man, right? So, uh, the current population, there is, a, there is a move again to declassify the elephants from Appendix 1. Most of the countries are telling to declassify the elephants from Appendix 1 and bring it back to Appendix 2. Otherwise, it, become, it might increase at a very, very alarming rate. So, this was about the case study on African elephants, right? So, till now, elephants have been kept under Appendix 1, right? So, they are strictly being monitored and uh, 
uh, conserved. Right? And the last case study that you have, uh, a topic which uh, most of you are well accustomed with, that is the study on the ozone depletion. So you get a few objective questions here and there from this particular part of uh, the case study. So ozone, as you know, O3, that is a gas that is there in the stratosphere, right? And it prevents the ultraviolet rays from penetrating and reaching the earth. Now in class 12, what we need to study here is the depletion of the ozone which is about 4% per decade. In every 10 years, 4% of the ozone was disappearing, right? So, uh, we have to understand about Chapman's cycle. This is a question that comes in your examination. What is Chapman's cycle? So, Chapman's cycle is the cycle of production of ozone in the stratosphere. How the oxygen gets the O2, gets converted to O3 and again because of the heat, the UV rays, the O3 gets converted to oxygen molecules. Again, they combine to form ozone. This oxygen to ozone and ozone to oxygen cycle that is there, that continuously occurs in the stratosphere, that is called the Chapman's cycle. Okay? So this is an objective question and uh, you have to understand that the total mass of ozone that is produced per day in the stratosphere is about 400 million metric tons. Almost 400 million metric tons of ozone is produced every day in the stratosphere and that is because of the sun's rays that is coming and reaching the stratosphere. So this cycle of ozone to oxygen, oxygen to ozone, that is called the Chapman's cycle. And the next part uh, you have to understand, you may be asked in your examination, the ODS. The ODS stands for ozone depleting substances. So what are the ozone depleting substances? The most important one as you all know is CFC that is chlorofluorocarbon. Then uh, besides that we have halons and methyl uh, chloroform, carbon, tetrachloride. All these are known to destroy the ozone layer. Definitely the most important uh, substance that destroyed the ozone layer was the chlorofluorocarbon which was used long back as coolant in the refrigerator, air conditioners, coolers, plastic manufacturing industries, foam manufacturing industries, it, uh, body sprays, perfumes, it found, it found its application. So this CFC, chlorofluorocarbon, the chlorine part of this particular compound reached the ozone layer and that chlorine was responsible for destroying the ozone molecule, right? So after this, when we, when the scientists understood about CFC having a bad impact on the ozone layer, it was banned all over the world. CFC was banned all over the world so that the ozone layer could be protected. But the damage that had already occurred in the ozone layer could not be repaired. So the first ozone hole was found in the Antarctic region, then the Arctic region and then almost all over the world holes in the ozone layer were discovered. And uh, what were the effects of uh, the depletion of the ozone layer? Definitely the UV rays penetrated earth when they came in contact with human beings, eye cataract, slow, slow blindness, photokeratitis it is called a disease. Uh, when you lose your sight, uh, uh, that deformity was found in human beings, skin cancer, all these kind of uh, diseases uh, erupted in man because of exposure to ultraviolet rays. Then plants were affected, photosynthesis in plants were affected because the soil lost its moisture, crop production was lessened uh, when UV rays started penetrating earth, even non living elements, they were affected, uh, uh, paints and dyes, they did dried rubber things, they started getting deteriorated because of UV rays penetrating earth. 
So natural agents that destroy the ozone layer definitely cannot be prevented like volcanic eruption which releases a lot of chlorine into the air you cannot prevent a volcanic eruption and that chlorine from reaching the stratosphere which is a natural phenomenon but what we can do to save the ozone layer is to put a ban on CFC which has already been done a long time back right so CFCs have already been banned and uh, nobody can repair the ozone layer but that repair as I told you through Chapman's cycle the repair occurs on its own so whenever we see any product today we buy some products we always see CFC and a cross on that product you see the symbol on product CFC and a cross which signifies that the product has not used CFC so this is the only remedy possible from mankind to prevent the depletion of the ozone layer. So these were the three key studies uh, out of which you will get your question. Uh, the Amazonian forest, then we did the ivory trade in Africa and the last one was ozone layer depletion. The next topic I will be discussing with you in the next lecture. Thank you class.